So, uh, good morning and welcome to another episode of Promote Science. We have with us here Professor Sir Michael Berry and he is here for a Gyan course at Iser Kolkata on super oscillations and uh, weak measurement. So, we will have an informal chat with him. So, Professor Berry, how would you explain your research to a non-technical audience? I would say that the at the core of my research in theoretical physics is understanding how the different theories in physics, the different levels of description of the world are related to each other. So this is all about connections. There's a way to say it. Physics is not only about the nature of things, but it's about the connections between the different natures of different things. I mean, very briefly, that's a summary, but I've worked on many, many different areas of, uh, of physics, and uh, it, it, many of them are phenomena involving waves of different kinds. Water waves, tsunamis, for example, um, light waves, in particular, optical phenomena that you see in nature, rainbows sparkling with the sun on the sea, things of this kind. Um, and, uh, and waves of quantum mechanics. They're, of course, more abstract waves that are not familiar to our direct perceptions, but they're waves just like sound waves and light waves and water waves. And uh, I spend much time studying the common mathematical features underlying the phenomena that these different types of waves uh, exhibit. Yeah. Sir, sir, please tell us like, uh, how you got interest, interested into science. Well, I will tell you. I had a not very happy childhood in the sense that my parents were not uh, very friendly to each other and uh, I suppose this is now a psychological interpretation that an early interest in astronomy was a kind of escape from the mundane unpleasantness of the everyday world. I don't know if this is correct, I'm not a psychologist, but I certainly became very passionately interested in astronomy as a child. And then uh, when I was at school, I realized that uh, underneath astronomy is physics. And when I went to university, therefore, I chose to study physics. And it became clear to me that uh, there's a great deal of mathematical beauty in the theories of physics. And this meant that when I went further into the subject, I became a theorist. I'm not completely uh, uh, somebody who avoids experiments, but... Uh, Mostly I, I'm a theorist and I understand, I try to understand the mathematical structure of the world as we express it in our physical theories. Okay, so Professor Berry, do you have any recollections about discovering the Pancharatnam Berry phase? Well, I do have recollections and uh, it's a complicated story and it illustrates uh, what uh, has been called the phenomenon of the chance favouring the prepared mind because I had some precursors of this uh, of this phase uh, uh, very simple examples which I which were already known to mathematicians uh, uh, and I was applying these in quantum physics and I gave a lecture and somebody at the end asked a question uh, this was in 1983 uh, and I said, oh, this is fairly simple. The change of sign, which was the old um, uh, aspect of the theory, will change into some phase. I will tell you tomorrow. I'll go back to the hotel and think about it. Well, it didn't uh, uh, emerge so easily. And I went back to Bristol and spent a, a very, very hard week or two. And then this whole theory came out. So it came from a question. But I was prepared for it because it's about the phase of waves. And phase is something that has interested me from the very earliest times. Now, uh, uh, you call it the Pancharatnam Berry phase, I would call it the Hamilton, Pancharatnam, Budden, Smith, Mead, Trula Berry phase, if I would give names, because uh, one of the first things I did once this phase became fashionable, which it did in the 1980s, was to write a paper about all the people who discovered aspects of it before me. Nothing emerges from nothing, you see. And it, I, in my case, I found it myself, but then I realized there were lots of pre-existing literature. And two years later, 1986, I came to India, uh, where I'd been before, and where, I, which, where I often visit, and I met two of my friends in the uh, Raman Institute in, uh, in Bangalore, 
uh, Rajaram Nityananda and, uh, uh, and, 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 um, and Rama Session, uh, and they said, we found this old paper of uh, Pancharatnam, who was the brother of uh, Rama Session, and by the way, one of the brilliant dynasty of physicists related to C. V. Raman, got the Nobel Prize for physics, whom you all know, and every Indian uh, is, is familiar with, with his name. He had very brilliant uh, uh, family, nephews. The famous Chandrasekhar, another Nobel Prize winner. Three brothers, uh, Ramasechan, another Chandrasekhar, liquid crystal person, and Pancharatnam, who unfortunately I never knew because he died young, and Raman's son, Rad, Radha Krishnan, a radio astronomer of great distinction. All, many of these people, I, well, I knew all of them except Raman and uh, Pancharatnam. So I, I said, well, I don't, I don't know this work. What is it? And they'd written a paper in your Indian version of nature called Current Science, which I looked at and uh, didn't understand. But on the plane going home, I did understand it completely. And I realized that what Pantaran would discover was a special case of the geometric phase for a simple class of systems and applied in a special context of polarization optics. But in that context, it's very brilliant. And he was only in his early 20s when he discovered this. So I became a fan of Pancharatnam and uh, many years later I wrote an article praising many aspects of his work because I have his collected papers. So, uh, but, but I, in particular I wrote a paper called, uh, the title you must think very carefully about, Pancharatnam's phase and the geometric phase, okay, uh, which carefully drew out the connections between the general theory and the special case, the very important, that he had discovered. So. Again, a complicated, entangled history of uh, meeting personal interaction, meeting people I knew, and they had discovered things from somebody they knew and were indeed related to, and my earlier interest in phase, all coming together in ways which are, which are uh, not uh, straightforward. And indeed, I realised even later that in my university in Bristol, there had been a tradition of this type of physics where the people who contributed the different aspects hadn't realised that they were studying different aspects of the same thing, a certain kind of geometry. In dislocations in crystals, disclination in liquid crystals, something in quantum mechanics called the Aharonov bohm effect before my time there, something else which we had discovered, um, which we call optical vortices, and then the geometric phase. These are all examples of a particular geometric phenomenon called anholonomy, where you change some quantities uh, and bring them back to the same values, you change them around a cycle, but something else has become different at the end. The familiar example, since I guess I'm speaking to non-technical people, is when you park a car, right? If you reverse into a narrow space, you often find that you're rather far from the curve, and you have to perform a large number of manoeuvres, each of which is cyclic. You drive and you steer, you drive and you steer, but after each one, you've moved a little closer to the curb. So you in the car perform a sequence of variables that's cyclic, you're back at the same state every time, but the car has moved, right? So that's the, a, a non-quantum, non-wave example of this general uh, geometrical phenomenon, which appeared in, it's called anholonomy, and it appeared in seven or eight different bits of work that were done in my department over decades. So I wrote a paper to celebrate the 80th birthday of a very distinguished scientist there, Charles Frank, which I called Bristol and Holonomy Calendar, listing all these things, ending with the geometric phase. Sir, it is indeed uh, very inspiring to hear about your recollections regarding your discovery. Sir, uh, I wanted to ask you a personal question like, uh, what do you do apart from uh, engaging in research? Like, what are your hobbies? hobbies yeah. I reject the notion of hobbies. We had a vice-chancellor in Bristol, that's like a director, a, a, a president of, a, of the university, who wrote an article, I think it was mainly for the administrative people, about this fashionable notion of work-life balance. And I wrote an angry letter to him saying, we scientists don't do work-life balance, we have life, work is part of it. But I do enjoy cooking, I enjoy reading, I enjoy walking. Okay, but this is all part of life and I'm doing physics all the time while doing those other things. So I don't really draw a distinction. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, sir, do, do you like the Indian food? Like oh, very much so. I <laughs> love it. I mean, my secret, which I'm now revealing, yeah. see, I'm traveling all over the world, yeah. and uh, this year I've made 30 foreign trips. I do it because I love the food in different countries. Yeah. Of course, I love meeting people, doing physics. Of course, I do. Yeah. But I love to eat the cuisine of different countries. And this year, I've been to Italy, to Iran, uh, to Israel, many places. But Indian food, I especially like. And you know, it's very popular in England. Yeah. Still, people here, they say, oh, it's not too spicy. And I tell them that as long ago as the 1970s, the most popular takeaway meal in England was not fish and chips, it was curry and chips. <laughs> so uh, I, I love it, yes. Yeah. So the last question, Yes. and this is related to the Indian context. So mm. Mm. Uh, now it's, it's often said that it's a little difficult to do experimental sort of work mm. because of mm. uh, funding issues. Yes. So what would, you, what would your message be to the young researchers in this field who are trying to work despite the current financial situation? Well, my message is this, that, uh, and, and I must emphasize, I'm not an experimentalist, but still I meet many experimentalists who do experiment related to some of my work. Now, and it's this, that there are areas of experimental physics that don't require very much, uh, very uh, extensive funding. So, for example, the study of the optical singularities, which, uh, uh, which we pioneered theoretically in the 70s and 80s, um, was developed to a great degree experimentally in the Ukraine. Now, the Ukraine is not a rich country, and, and after the separation from the Soviet Union, uh, they had to make all the apparatus themselves, and, and so, but it's not... Uh, it's not high energy physics, it's not yeah. uh, space science, although you have that in India, of course. Uh, so by, with ingen ingenuity, with very little money, you can do a great deal of uh, good experimental work. And this now ha this happens in India as well. It, for example, in Hyderabad, there's a group of uh, Nirmal Viswanathan, who's now also studying these phase singularities and doing world standard research with not enormous resources, you know, nowadays lasers aren't that expensive and uh, all the rest you can make yourself, um, and they do. So uh, uh, my message is, don't think that you can only do theoretical work if you have limited resources. Search for areas which don't require large funding, and there still are such areas. Uh, I mentioned optics, there's not the only one, of course. Thank you, sir, sir. Thank you, sir, for such an inspiring well, I hope talk. I that was helpful. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, it was very great. It will inspire a lot thank of you. young people.